first thing, uh, let me ask you any questions for me, any concerns? No? La vie va bien. <laughs> Life is good. Okay. So um, I have a few news for you today. Um, and after that, we're going to continue what we started last lecture, so complex gene interactions. First, um, I'm getting a lot of questions, at least me, I don't know about the TAs, but I'm getting more questions about the content of the exam than the course material I'm teaching. Okay? So I'm going to have to be a little bit serious now, which I don't like to do, but I'm not here to discuss exam content. I'm here to teach. Okay? So please, if you have questions to ask me, ask me about the material so I can explain it to you, and I'll spend 10 hours with you if I have to. Okay? But the exam is meant to test you, right? So I can give you a little bit of info, but at the end of the day, you have to, you know? Uh, so we have to think about that. Um, second thing, I got a lot of questions about the tutorial questions. Um, is it because the TAs are not doing their job properly, or is it just because number 59 is complicated? <laughs> Do you have any uh, answer for me, someone? No? Sometimes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. So let me. Uh, let me kind of uh, explain the goal of the tutorial, okay? The idea is like, if you have a lab, you're going to practice what you're learning in, in, in class, right? The technique that you talked about, right? So the tutorial is exactly the same thing, but for solving problems. So the idea about the tutorial is not lecture style. It's more problem solving. So when you go there, it's kind of a focused group to do problems in there. And then you get to see how people solve the other problems. Right now, we don't have enough time to do all the problems in a tutorial. Technically, you should be doing them all by yourself, okay? Because you need to practice for your exam. But sometimes it's kind of hard to do them all by yourself, and sometimes you need some sort of guidance on how to solve the problems. So you would do that in the tutorial. So the idea behind the tutorial is that each one, each group solves a problem together. By teaching it to each other and explaining to each other, you get to understand the problem better. And then you solve it in front of the class so they can uh, kind of see how you went through it. And then the TA is supposed to just jump in whenever you have a question or um, whenever you don't understand something. Does that make sense? Now, why the tutorial is the tutorial? That's a uh, department stuff. That's not <laughs> what would you like to have in the tutorial? If, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I understand in the in the tutorials we have questions that are super easy. You can solve in like two two seconds, and then usually when you get towards the last numbers, it gets more challenging. Okay. So I'll make something clear about that. For the challenging questions, and don't ask me this again. I'm tired of this question. The challenging questions will not be on the exam because one question would take you like 10, 15 minutes to solve. Does that make sense? Okay. So the challenging questions are meant just for you to develop your thinking, that's it. Because at the end of the day, we're not just doing exams or questions, we're actually trying to learn the material, right? So there's some easy questions, some hard ones, some, ones, some in the middle. So the easy ones, that's just because the concept is easy, right? The average ones, that's what you should be expecting in your midterm and in your final. And then the complex ones, it's just to make you think for the future of your career, okay? Does that make sense? Now the other thing is that I took this course from someone else. And it's kind of a bit everywhere because you start talking about something, then you skip something in the chapter, then you go to something else, and then you discuss chi-square together. So I know it's kind of like, right? So for next semester, I might be dropping the book completely or like finding a book that follows the right order. But the idea is if you follow the lectures, right? And you do the problems in the tutorial linked to the lectures, 
because you know, for example, uh, question 50, I forgot the polygenic trait question there. It is part of chapter three, right? But we covered it kind of the doses of, of uh, proteins or genes, kind of, but not that much. But later on in the course, we will. So for your final exam in chapter three, you need to do that. You understand what I mean? So it's a bit like mixed up. But the idea, lecture, questions linked to the lecture, that's your exam. If we didn't cover like physics, I'm not gonna ask you about physics. If we didn't cover like polygenic traits, I'm not gonna ask you in the exam about polygenic traits. It's not fair, right? Does that make sense? Okay, good. It's like, it's a, like I know it seems like a bit weird, but it's, uh, it's basic uh, kind of logic, right? Lecture, that's the material for the exam. Questions, some of them are super hard, some of them are easy, too, too easy. Obviously, I'm not gonna put like all the exam too easy or like just I'm gonna average it out to be fair to the students so that you have enough time to, to do it. And on top of that, the exams, I'm not the one preparing them. I'm taking it from someone else. So this person has like 30 years teaching 261. So they know what students are like able to do and uh, how much they can, you know, do in one hour and 15 minutes for 25 questions. Okay, so it's fair. And if we do it in the exam and then you, the whole class realizes, oh, we never learned this, which will never happen, then come see me, I'll remove the question. Okay, so this is to remove all the stress from you guys. <laughs> Now for the TAs, we have office hours, okay? The TAs are supposed to have office hours two hours every week. So if you have questions related to the problems, go there and stay there with them for one hour. They will explain it to you. The reason why I'm not, um, I'm not you know, solving problems with you guys, it's not because I don't wanna teach you the problem. It's just because we have to split the work in a way that makes the course work. Because me, I have to prepare the course and so they have to work on the tutorials. I could help you for the, the tutorial questions, but it's better to go see the persons that are in charge of it, right? Obviously, if you don't get it from them because it doesn't make sense, come see me, I'm not, uh, I'm not crazy, okay? Um, what else? But yeah, so let's say for example, you don't understand question number 59, which is about the tomato whatever, okay? Go see the TA, stay with them for like 10, 15 minutes and they will explain it to you, okay? Um, so take advantage of that. Um, and then if that still doesn't work, come see me. I'll be more than happy, okay? Now, that's for the TAs, the office hours. How was the quiz, quiz number two? Not bad? Sabine, good, easy? It was fine, okay. Yeah, so um, I'll, 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 see, I'll see with the grades and then I'll adjust from there, but right now the class is killing it, so it should be good. I got the grades from the other two tutorials. It's like most of it is 100%, okay? So that's, and obviously the more we get into the semester, the more it's gonna be complex theory because now you start with one gene and then you end up with like freaking molecules interacting with each other. So obviously you can expect it to get a little bit harder, but I'm not again gonna kill you with some super complex problems that I can't even solve myself, okay? <laughs> Make sense? So one more thing. Um, we have a guest lecture next Thursday. So uh, he's gonna come talk to you about genetic engineering, how he started as a student here, and then ended up building his own business, now getting investments and uh, things like this. That was his brother we saw right there. He had a meeting with Desjardins right now for investment. That's why he looked fancy. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, next, next um, I don't know, I, I try, I'm gonna try to maybe maybe bring coffee. I don't know, I asked the guys downstairs in SPS1 uh, if they did catering, they said no. So that means I have to get it from outside, so that's even, <laughs> that's uh, more problems. But uh, for those who show up, there will be something for you guys. For those who don't show up, well, c'est la vie. <laughs> so uh, not in terms of coffee, but I'll keep the surprise for Thursday, okay? Uh, if you want something good, come Thursday, okay? <laughs> uh, for the midterm, for the midterm, it will be the Tuesday right after. So after the guest lecture, I was thinking of doing a review session, and then we're just gonna solve. Uh, I, I will, I'll answer all your questions, whatever you have related to the lectures. So I'll just have all the PowerPoints and then we can go through it, and then I'll answer questions. That's for that. The midterm will be cut into two groups. Uh, if your family name starts with A to M, inclusive, then you'll be in this room. If your name starts with uh, N to Z, inclusive that's in CC 
one another. Okay, ACSD students, ACSD office, which will be um, in the C not CC AD one thirty, I think the health services, right there. Um, what else? Bring with with you a calculator because you will need it to solve problems and uh, count recombinant frequencies and all that. Um, and then uh, bring also a pencil, not a pen, because you'll be filling out these Scantron sheets, uh, which will be easier to grade. And then you'll get your grades like two or three days out, okay? Depending on how fast they, they do it. Um, and then finally, we got the final exam date. It's on the 23rd of April from 9 a.m. to 12 to noon. And it will be downtown as usual. The room, I'm not sure. I'm still waiting for it. This might change. Okay, this is a tentative schedule. Yep. Do I make alternate exams for finals? Uh, that's a very good question. No. <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, final exams, like uh, uh, you skip it and then you do it another day? Or you're talking about deferring the... Well, that you have to deal with the um, exam office for the final. I don't deal with that. Uh, I don't even take care of like, yeah. Since when this is a, you can choose two dates. So you can choose your date for the midterms, uh, the final? Jeez, where was this information was when I was a student? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this date might change. They're saying it's tentative because there's a lot of holidays in April. Um, so I don't know what holiday happens on the 23rd, but uh, the, it's Passover week or whatever. So I don't know uh, what's happening there. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's a lot of updates. Uh, please just don't forget your pencils so you don't make me count all your grades one by one. <laughs> so you can fill the scantron, you know. And uh, don't forget to come next Thursday because maybe you'll get some extra points. Maybe. <laughs> okay. So let's pick up where we uh, stopped last week. Uh, last lecture, I mean. I don't know what I have with this last week, but last lecture. So we were talking about lethality um, in terms, uh, no, in terms of genes. Yeah. So. There are genes that are important for um, for life, right? If you remove it, you will, the, the offspring will basically die, the person that doesn't have that, um, that gene. So uh, the genes that are not important, well, not, not important, but non-essential, we call them non-essential, and uh, actually most of the genes in the organism are non-essential. So if you can take a look, let me put my, uh, where's my thing here? Laser. <laughs> One second. Okay. So if you look here uh, to the right, you can see that, for example, for E. coli, uh, only 7% of the genes are essential. So the rest you can technically remove them and it's not going to affect. Well, it will affect it, but it will not die. Okay. Humans, it's a bit hard to test that. So, <laughs> so we, we, we do it mostly in cells. Um, and then if, uh, let's say for example, two genes, so one gene is not lethal, but if you have a combination of two genes that you remove and then it becomes lethal, we call that synthetic lethal, okay? Last lecture, I was also asked about this, uh, um, this question. It was at the end and I was saying random stuff. So let's uh, kind of uh, re-explain this um, in a more simple way. So I was asked how can the short bristles be dominant and at the same time recessive lethal, okay? So um, here, when we're talking about the short bristle allele, it has two phenotypes, okay? Two traits that we are looking at. First, the trait of the bristles on the Drosophila. That trait is dominant. What that means is that if you have the messed up allele, just one of them will give you short bristles. If you have two copies of this allele, then it will kill you, right? So. The allele is dominant in terms of uh, bristle phenotype, but its recessive, its inher inheritance is recessive in terms of lethality. Does that make sense? So if you have uh, short bristles, for example, that means that you have one dominant allele, 
which is the one that gives you short bristles, and then the recessive one is the healthy one. Okay, that's for the bristles phenotype, the trait. Now for the lethality trait, that's a different story because if you have the wild type, it's homozygous. Uh, so the wild type uh, is uh, alive, and then the mutation needs to be in a homozygous state to be lethal. Does that make sense? Kind of. I will do it on the board right now. But if you get a question like this, look at the F1 generation and think about what's missing there. Usually you should have the same amount of male and female. Um, and then at least uh, all the categories of male and female, short bristle, long bristle, etc. If you are missing one and there is a difference between the two sexes, then you can think that it's sex linked. And if you are missing one of the classes, it means that it's lethal, that class died. Okay, so these are things that you need to think about. And obviously, if you take a look here, you see that there's short bristle female, long bristle female, and then long bristle males. So what are we missing? We're missing short bristle males, right? So that means it's excellent. Lethal. Clear? Okay, good. So I'll just do the example on the whiteboard. Uh, I talked too much for the update, but uh, it's okay. I'll do it. So. One second. Okay, so when you get a question like this, we're uh, mating a short bristle female with, let me just go backwards like this, short bristle female with a normal long bristle male. So there's two ways of inheriting this, this, uh, this gene, either in a dominant way or in a recessive way, right? The recessive is expected to give you a three to one ratio, and then the dominant is going to give you um, one to one. Okay, so when you get a question like this, you have to—it's—it's it's hard to imagine. In, so you have to kind of um, not try an error, but kind of. Okay, so you have the two modes. You know that you have a, a, you have the allele for um, for the winged wings. One second, guys. So let's call this allele, this gene X. Okay, this gene determines the uh, wings. So now we have two alleles, one that gives you normal wings, long wings, and one that gives you short wings. If we're talking about a recessive inheritance pattern, then we expect that small s like this to give you, to give you, um, to give you the short bristle phenotype. If it's a dominant trait, we would expect this and whatever to give you the short bristle phenotype. So we're saying that we're crossing it, we were crossing it with a normal long bristle male. So if you do your tennis square, and then you have the Y chromosome here. Now we have a short bristle female and a uh, long bristle male. So two ways to do this. Either you use this as the female right here. So if this is short bristle, the male was long bristle, so it should be, uh, sorry guys. So the male will be um, long, so like this. And then the female will be small, like this. Uh, oops, sorry. OK. So here you'd have a heterozygous, right? So x plus b. And then here, to be small, that you'd have the same thing here. Then, okay, so when we get this data, assuming we need homozygous recessive to get the short bristle phenotype. In that case, this one here will have short bristles. This one will have short bristles. We don't have in the progeny short bristle males. So then what's the, uh, the other option? That it's dominant in, in terms of inher uh, inheritance. So in that case, uh, Joe, yes. Yeah, so, so in that case, if we're following this, this kind of inheritance, then, let me just erase all, you know what? Uh, this, and then, okay, I need to improve this thing here. Uh, 
One second, guys. <laughs> okay. So if we are thinking that it's a dominant inheritance, then this allele gives you short bristles. The male is long bristles. So then it would be it would be like this. And then the female has short bristles. So short bristles means means what? Means that it has one of the alleles. So big S, big B. And then now the question is heterozygous, homozygous. Now we have to think about the lethality, OK? So let's first do this one here. So to do this one here, uh, let's say, forget this for now. So it would be X as B, and then the small as B. And here we would have like that. And then um, here, OK, so now we have to determine this here. This one would, uh, is not present, right? Because this one would have short bristle male. So this makes sense with our data. This one here is also short bristle female. So what are we missing from the data? We're missing long bristled females and long bristled male. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I know, but um, <laughs> you, not everyone can just, uh, you know, so I have to do it step by step so people uh, get it. I don't know if everyone got it, but, you know, to make it more clear. So, so then this one here has to be small s, small b, right? To have a long bristle male which is this, and then a short, uh, long bristle female. And this one, dead. Make sense? OK, so this is like the long form of this answer. This answer. You can also just imagine that if the female has the two uh, alleles, she will die. And so obviously, this one has to be heterozygous. OK, good. Questions about this? Uh, yep. Exactly. So because here we're talking about two traits, right, that are affected by the same gene. So this is a pleiotropic effect, okay? So the short bristles, so that's the phenotype of the short bristles, that's inherited in a dominant way. So one allele is sufficient to give you short bristles. And then the wild type is the recessive allele, okay? Now for the other one, it's inherited, the lethality is inherited in a recessive way, okay? So that means the wild, so that means the homozygous recessive is the one that will give you the uh, lethality, which is uh, recessive. Yeah, so that's, that's where people get mixed, right? Let's try again. So short bristles, the phenotype is so when we talk about dominance and recessiveness, it's just the relationship between one allele to the other, okay? So what that means is when you have an, a dominant allele, its effect hides the effect of the other allele in the heterozygote. So in the case of short bristles, just one allele messed up will overcome the effect of the other healthy allele. So this one is the dominant, and then the recessive allele is now the healthy one, right? Okay, so that makes sense. Let's take the same gene, the same variation of the gene that gives the short bristles. Now, the healthy type is the one that's alive, right? So that's the dominant allele. Now, the recessive one now in this case is the one that kills you, right? And it needs to be in a homozygous state. So two, two, so that's what we call it, recessive lethal. Cool? Questions? No, see, that's the thing. Yeah, uh, this, uh, this thing mixes up people. Take it into two different traits, OK? And when we're talking about the phenotype just for the bristles, this is considered dominant. When we're talking about lethality, this now becomes recessive. Does that make sense? Even though there's big S, big B, right? Yeah. it would become both recessive. But uh, you would not basically see the phenotype for that, right? You would end up with that two to one. Yeah. OK. So there's that. Jeez. 
I don't know how we're going to do this, but I have to try to be fast. Okay. So that's basically what I just showed here. So let's skip that. So now there's other variations. So last lac lecture, we looked at uh, incomplete dominance, codominance, and uh, recessive lethal. There's also other ways for inheritance to happen, which changes the ratios that we link. One of them is the existence of two, uh, three or more alleles in the same gene, because you'd ha you could have multiple variations of the same gene. And then depending on the combinations of inheritance, it affects the ratios. You can also have multiple genes affecting the same trait. So for example, uh, I don't know, um, hair, hair eye color is like controlled by, I don't know, I think 16 genes or something like this. Okay, they all work towards the same trait. So there's things like this. And then there's this thing called epistasis, which refers just to the interaction between genes, because usually genes affect each other. And so you can have one gene suppressing another gene or activating it. And we'll be looking at this. And I don't think we're going to get to complementation testing today, but we'll see. So let's start with the first one. Three or more alleles. So we saw this example in when we were talking about codominance. So blood type, there is three alleles for it. There's the A allele, the B allele, and then the small i here, which is the null allele. If you have IA, you, be, you have A antigens on your blood cells. If you have the B, you have B antigens. If you have both, you end up with the AB antigens on your blood cells. And then if you have the small i here, you end up with no antigens. Okay? Now, one more thing to think about. If your body has the A antigen, it means you will produce B antigens to protect yourself from the other type of blood, the other foreign agents. So whenever you have to do a transfusion, if you mix up the blood types and you put B instead of A, these antibodies will attack your red blood cells and destroy it. So that's why it's very dangerous. Um, so if we think about it this way, then the B1, so the person that has the B allele will have anti-A antibodies. If you have, so you can see that the IA inhibits, uh, no, inhibits the A antibody because you don't want to produce antibodies against your own blood, okay? If you have IA and IB, so in the heterozygous state, then you'll end up producing no antibodies because your cells have both the A and B antibody. So this means that um, this one here, because it does not produce any antibodies, it can receive from anyone because it will not attack the blood of anyone, okay? O, so this is the uh, universal uh, acceptor. And then the O, because you don't have the A and B, you don't produce the antigens, uh, so you, but you produce the antibodies because uh, okay. you're protecting yourself from uh, that type of uh, blood, okay? So these guys can donate to everyone because they don't have anything on their cell surface, so that means they will not be recognized by any other um, blood uh, antibodies. One thing that is important to take note of, here we're lucky with Quebec, so whenever you need a transfusion, uh, you can get it, but some poor countries, not really poor countries, like for example, Algeria, um, to get blood, it's very complicated. It's not like just uh, you go to the hospital and then sometimes people like put it on Facebook and try to find you, like if you're looking for an iPad, okay? Obviously, now there, uh, there's these associations that were created that are trying to do that, that look like Emma Quebec, but a few years ago, it was very hard to uh, get blood, <coughs> okay? So how do we produce these different, uh, these different blood types? So let's say you have a parent that is um, small i and big A, so of blood type A, and then you made that person with a blood type B, then you can produce all the different variations because you will make the uh, O type so the kids can be O, can be A, or can be a, B or AB. Does that make sense? Simple? Okay. So question for you. Yep. The resist factor is uh, in like three slides. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me ask you a question here. So what are the expected phenotype ratios among the offsprings when one parent has the AB type and the other parent has the O type? I swear if you answer 9331. <laughs> yeah. C, exactly. It's 1, uh, one, one okay? So why is it 1, 1? It's because um, 
when you when you have a a b type so a b and then the other one is o so small i small i you can only produce these ones here so two of them will be type a two of them will be type b good job okay rhesus factor anybody knows what this is so that's another type of kind of protein that is found on your blood type on your blood cells so sometimes you'll see a plus or a minus in your blood type that's because if you have the rhesus factor or not now this thing is a bit scary um, hopefully i won't scare anybody but um, the rhesus factor is same thing you have antibodies against it or not so let's say for example there is a rhesus positive male mating with a rhesus negative woman then the baby could be rhesus positive and then the females the baby the fetus blood with the 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 mother's blood mix up and then it will attack the fetus okay so uh on top of making sure that the person has a job and a house you have to make sure that they have a good reason factor okay <laughs> because uh there's a uh, high chances of uh losing the baby okay it's all, like i think it's like 50 percent or something like this because you're attacking your own baby basically okay so uh ask them ne next time <laughs> uh okay am i going too fast no? Good. So um, the, the, this is another example for the multiple alleles of the same gene. So beetles, this little insect here, um, has different colors on top of their wing covers. They can have blue, turquoise, or green. So when you look at it like this, you can think maybe in complete dominance, right? Because turquoise, green, whatever, or blue. Okay. Uh, but it could be also just the same thing, uh, the, just one gene, but different alleles. So let's say you get a list of, maybe on the exam, maybe not, I don't know. I know you guys are going to tell me, you're going to ask me. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you get a list like this, uh, let's say you're a scientist trying to figure out if it's one gene or multiple genes, and if it's different alleles or uh, whatever. So you, you, you do the crosses, right? And you get these results. So if you cross a blue one with a green, you get all blue, right? If you cross blue with blue, now you get a three to one ratio. So you can already think that maybe this one is a dihybrid, uh, is a heterozygous cross, right? Monohybrid. If you take a look, the first one here is telling you that blue is dominant to green, right? And then if you look at, uh, what else? Let me see. And then if you look at this one here, you can see that green is dominant to turquoise, right? because if you cross green with green, most of the progeny is green, and then some of it is turquoise, right? And then the ratios we're observing here are three to one, and one to two to one, and one to one. So that's, that's already supposed to tell you it's one gene, without like even thinking about it. Because if you saw nine to three to three to one, or nine to seven, or nine to three to four, then you would think it's two genes, right? But because you see these ratios here, automatically you should know that it's one gene. So in that case, the only possibility for you to produce these, um, these ratios is one gene, but multiple alleles. And we see, and so, um, well, I just answered this question, but basically uh, the, the color is genetically controlled by one gene and multiple alleles, okay? But we'll see how. The observations, I just did them with you guys, but I wrote them here. Uh, you have them for your notes. And then because the three to one ratio, there's a three to one ratio, you can remove the idea of incomplete dominance because you have, uh, in the phenotypes, you have two categories only. So that's typical of incomplete, uh, of complete dominance. If it was incomplete dominance, you would get one that is blue, two that are uh, turquoise, let's say, and one that is green because that's the middle, I guess, or I don't know, okay? Whatever color is in the middle, <laughs> okay? so. Um, again, just to reiterate, if let's say the gene B is for the color, should have been C, but whatever. And then you have the different alleles. So the allele that gives you the blue color is dominant to the green one, and which is dominant to the turquoise one. And you can see this from cross two. So blue dominant to turquoise, blue is dominant to green. So cross is one and five, right? And then. Uh, Green is dominant to turquoise, so that's cross number three. Okay. Would you be able to figure out the 
the crosses here with the alleles. Second cross. Yeah. So blue and blue gives you uh, three blue and one turquoise. So right there, how do we get three to one usually? We get it by doing a heterozygous with a heterozygous, right? And then you would have one homozygous dominant, two, one homozygous recessive, and two of them that are heterozygous. And then the one that's homozygous dominant with the two that are heterozygous are the same phenotype. So that's a three to one ratio, okay? So how can blue cross blue give turquoise? Let me show you on the board. So it's gonna be a little bit easier. So remember, when we do a cross, let's say, um, I'll just give an example from before and then get back to what we're doing. So parent one, parent two, okay? Um, and then you get this like this, big A, small A, big A, uh, small A. So you end up with uh, okay. this. And if this is recessive, obviously, so uh, uh, then you'd have all these looking the same, right? And then this one looking different, so that's your three to one ratio. So what does that really mean in terms of color? If you do blue cross with blue, we said that there's probably three alleles in, in this story. So the way you write it, let's say the gene for color is called B, uh, and then you have the blue, and then the turquoise allele crossed with blue and then turquoise allele. So because B is dominant to T, this will be blue, this will be blue. And then if you do the cross and you do the Punnett square, you'll end up with like this. Like this. Uh, wait one second. Yeah, and then does this make sense? Okay, so this is the turquoise. These are all blue. Cool. Okay. Uh, what else? Do we do another one? Let's say you cross green with green, you get three to one. So instead of B here, just put G. Okay, green. Um, let me see if there's one that's interesting to do. It's the same thinking behind all of them. If you have, if you have blue crossed with green, gives you one blue and one green. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. So right there, how can you do that? How can you do that? Anybody? Sorry? Blue is heterozygous, so. Blue crossed with green gives you one blue, one green. So, like this. Right? This is test cross. Similar pattern as a test cross, right? And so if you do this, you'll end up with one, one to one ratio. Two of them of the progeny will be blue, two of them will be uh, green. Ça fait du sens? Okay. Jeez, I need a lot more time than this one. Um, whiteboard, that's the answer. You can also have duplicate genes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, exa okay. So this one, blue and blue, gives you blue and turquoise, right? So here, the blue, uh, so it's a three to one ratio, so they're both, it's a, Monohybrid, right? They're both heterozygous. And so the second allele in is the for the turquoise, right? And then you're doing, a, which one is the other one? This one here, blue and blue. So in this case, you would have uh, the second allele that you're dealing with is the one for the green, right? Because you have multiple alleles, so you can kind of, you know. Um, does that make sense, guys? Okay, good. Duplicate genes. So as I said earlier, uh, we have a lot of genes that are non-essential, and on top of that, we have a lot of redundancy in our DNA. So there's sometimes seven, 10 genes that are 
doing the same same job. Okay, and this happened because there was a duplication of the genome. Um, uh, not, I mean, not duplication of the genome, but duplication of genes. Uh, in some species, like uh, yeast, there was a duplication of genome. Um, so my first research project was trying to understand how uh, there were ten variations of the enolase. Um, of the enolase enzyme, part of the glycolysis, across uh, across evolution, right? And so, it, because it, there was duplication events, multiple duplication events. Okay. Um, the project was kind of boring. <laughs> the cool part of it was the uh, the bioinformatics, and not really the evolution part. Okay. Um, hopefully, the prof doesn't see this. <laughs> He's still here. <laughs> uh, what did I want to say? So if there is two genes that affect the same trait, right, and the duplicated gene is on a different chromosome, then when you do a dihybrid cross, because now you have two genes affecting the same trait, you'll end up with an inheritance pattern of 1 to 15 in the F2. And how does that work? So let's take a look at this uh, shepherd's purse, um, unrelated to our course, but shepherd's purse is... Um, is actually a medicinal plant. It's used for, it has antibacterial properties, including gonorrhea, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know it's kind of uh, weird, uh, but uh, it also has anti-inflammation properties, so it's used for a lot of things. Okay? Obviously, uh, there's medication that does the job better, but just to give you an example of a plant that has medical um, properties. Usually the drugs that you get from the doctor were kind of, they come from some sort of plant or whatever, and then they were made more potent and all that. So uh, that's one thing. So let's say there's two genes, A and B, that affect the uh, fruit shape of this shepherd's purse, okay? If we cross it with, uh, if we do a test cross to see the ratio, and you will see that it's a modified uh, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, because whenever one gene is mutated, the other complements for it. The other kind of replaces its job. Okay, so when you do that, you'll end up with only the double recessive in both A and B that has uh, in both genes A1 and A2 that have a different shape. All the others have the same shape. So that's your 1 to 15 ratio or 15 to 1. Yeah. Anything. Yeah, either the big A2 or small A2. Okay. And I made a mistake. No, I have a narrow fruit, 160. No, I didn't make a mistake. That's good. An example, real life example of uh, duplication of genes. Now, there's a, there's a protein called amylase. You probably heard about it. It breaks down starch. And so this amylase was found to be uh, multiplied seven times in the genome for people of European and American descent, right? And you can think about how our food is for it starch, right? Uh, anybody from Congo? Nobody? Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is a bit touchy to <laughs> talk about stuff like this because I don't know really who these uh, booty are. I took this from a paper. But uh, there's these booty people. So this is a study that tried a lot of different groups of people and looked at the amylase uh, protein. And then, uh, obviously, this there's a lot more than just this. I just gave you an example. Um, they have five copies, and these people are not eating the same diet as us. They are more like hunters and gatherers, okay? And then if you take a look at, for example, um, animals, um, chimpanzees, they have only two copies of this amylase gene, okay? And so um, this first tells you that there's uh, multiple copies of, your, of a gene in your DNA, but also the environment affects the, your DNA. And so depending on, let's say, for example, we keep eating starch, high starch foods from now on in like 100 million years, we'll probably have like 30, 40 copies. Okay. It's just exaggerating, but this is the, the, the idea behind it. The last mechanism is epistasis. So one thing that is important is keep in mind the ratios. Okay. We already talked about 115. Remember what it is diagnostic of. It's two genes affecting the same trait. Um, Weird things like this, that's probably multiple alleles for one gene. And then, so epistasis occurs when there's a gene that uh, the effect of one gene masks the effect of uh, the other one, okay? 
and, uh, and how can this work? So for example, one gene can make a substrate and the other gene make the uh, enzyme. And so this is how the effect works. If you don't have the substrate, even if your enzyme is healthy, the substrate will not bind to the enzyme. And so that's suppressing the effect of the healthy enzyme, okay? So an example of that is epistasis and, uh, for albinism. In mice, there's an allele that's responsible for uh, albinos. Let's call it just C allele, okay? If you have it homozygous recessive, then you'll end up with white looking uh, uh, mice, okay? If you have it uh, either in the heterozygous state or the homozygous dominant state, you'll end up with brown or uh, black, okay? And uh, these mice are super nice. If you ever work with mice, uh, the brown ones are super aggressive. They bite, okay? <laughs> Um, these ones are pretty chill, and they're a bit bigger, so they're easier to, to handle. Uh, hopefully, that will not uh, disgust people. Whatever. <laughs> okay. So then, there's another gene that affects the fur coat uh, color by making it either black or brown, and that's let's just call it the B gene. So individuals who have a homozygous recessive for the C gene doesn't matter what you have for the B gene, you'll end up al albine, right? Because it will hide the other allele. So this is called epistasis. How can that happen? So let's say you have two parents that are uh, black, the hybrid, and then you cross them together. You'll end up with, you won't end up with a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. You'll end up with a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio. And the reason is because, so the du uh, double recessive is albino, but there's also this one here, which is albino no matter what you have on this side here. And so these are four albinos, three brown and nine black. So this is a ratio that is typical of epistasis. Make sense? So we have three to one, that's one gene, nine to three to three to one, that's two genes. And then in the nine to three to three to one, we have one 15, which is two genes uh, affecting the same trait. We have nine to three to four, which is epistasis. And we'll get to another ratio in a few minutes. Um, but is that clear, by the way? I'm uh, trying to go fast because uh, trying to not make the other guy there wait after us. Okay. So uh, if there's nothing, something that's not clear, just let me know. So how do we know? Let's say, for example, you have two individuals that are mutant as phenotype. How do you determine if it's the same gene or two different genes? Because you could have two. Uh, two, uh, two progeny, two offsprings that are this similar, but doesn't mean that they were caused by the same, uh, same exact mutation. Remember I told you that there's sometimes 10 genes that affect the same trait? So you could have a mutation in either of the 10 genes and have the same phenotype. So the way you do this is by doing something called a complementation test. Or a, um, you cross them together, but I'll explain what the complementation is test. If you cross them together, if you end up with uh, the mutant phenotype, then you end up uh, knowing that they're both on the same genes, these mutations. If you end up with the wild type, that means one is correcting the other. So it's complementing for the other. Okay. Um, and we'll see an example here. So when you want to test complementation, you can do it in any organism, but the easiest is uh, yeast because they are haploid. And then they have a diploid state. So let's take, for example, a yeast that has um, red colored colonies. And then you have two, two of them. You're not sure if it's, they're both coming from the same gene or they're coming from different genes. So you would mate them together, you would produce a diploid, right? And so this diploid, if you look at it, if it looks like the parental, that means it's mutations on the same gene. If it changes color and becomes white like this, that means it's on a different gene because one has a bad copy in one gene, the other has a bad copy in the other gene, but together they have two healthy copies of each gene, well, one of each gene, and so they fix the problem, okay? So in terms of crosses, if you look at, uh, so if you look at mutations that are uh, recessive, you can do this for dominant mutations. So you, you could, but it's a bit more uh, complicated. So for now, just think recessive mutation. So the haploid, you would be crossing ADE 
1 minus with ADE 1 minus, you can just imagine that ADE gives the, uh, the color, okay? So these two are both red. So then the diploid will end up being a ADE minus uh, 1 minus, but just diploid, okay? Two copies of that. If the mutations are in different genes, then uh, what's going to happen is that the cross will be, so one gene will be mutated for one of the parents, let's say ADE1, and then the other copy will be healthy. And then for the other parent, you'll end up with the opposite. And so when you cross it, the diploid will end up with one healthy copy of each gene and one messed up. Because it's recessive, one healthy copy is sufficient to have the uh, good trait. So then they end up changing color and becoming white. Does that make sense? No? Good. Do we do this in... Uh, so the good terminology to use for this is that they have failed to complement when the parents are the same as the mutant because the two genes are on the same, the two mutations are on the same gene. If they complement, one saves the other kind of, then you can say that they're on, on different genes, but affecting the same trait. Let's do it for a diploid, diploid organism. So if you have a diploid organism, like for example, uh, these flowers here, then you can do the cross between them, but you will not be able to know if it's uh, multiple genes or not, or what's happening, okay? You can figure out the inheritance pattern, which is recessive, but you don't know what's happening, okay? Because the mutant one and two will give you the same thing, okay? So how can this happen? How can you have two genes that, um, that affect the color, okay? So let's say, for example, gene one, makes uh, an enzyme, and that enzyme converts uh, compound A to compound B. That enzyme there, uh, that compound A and B are both white uh, in terms of color. But then you need enzyme 2 to turn the compound B into compound C. So this is just an intermediate, let's say. If you mess up the enzyme, B, uh, enzyme 1, then you, don't, you end up not producing compound B because um, you don't have the enzyme to convert this to B, and then, uh, but you're still able to convert B to C. It's just that you don't have the substrate for it, okay? If you do the same with B2, if you do the same with B2, you're gonna end up with, uh, with making, uh, not being able to make compound C. So you can see how two mutations in two different genes can still give the same phenotype, and that they both need each other to produce the uh, healthy phenotype. Yeah. How mutation B1 would prevent it from making uh, blue? Because to make compound B and C, you need compound A. And so compound A here cannot be converted into B. B exactly. You accumulate A and you have less B, uh, you have no B and C. Clear? Technically, if you add B to the, to these uh, cells, I don't know, inject it or whatever, they will switch to B. Yeah, no problem. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, what did I want to say? So let's look at this in terms of, um, in terms of genotypes. So let's assume that both of them have a mutation in different genes. So then in this case, you would have this kind of genotype, homozygous dominant for B1, homozygous recessive for B2, and then the other flower would have the opposite. So homozygous dom uh, dominant, no, homozygous dominant for uh, B2 and then homozygous recessive for B1. So when you cross them, what color and genotype would you predict for this offspring? Anybody? So there will be heterozygous, but the color? Blue, that's it. There you go, very simple. Does that make sense? Because you have one, one healthy B, one, uh, B1 and one healthy B2, so that means you have the enzyme to convert A into B, and you also have the enzyme to convert B to C, and so you end up with C. That's the picture. Um, this only works if the mutations are recessive. 
So that means you need two copy of it to kind of have the effect. If it's dominant, it's a bit more complicated uh, out of the scope of this course. But basically what you do is that you use a suppressor and then you suppress the genes that you're interested in and see if it affects both or just one of them, okay? Uh, both traits or one of them. So if you end up with uh, no B, no C, you know it's this, or if you end up with um, just no A, no B, uh, no A, then you know it's enzyme one, okay? So you try to suppress them and see if it affects the whole pathway, half the pathway, et cetera. And lastly, very fast lecture today. I'll figure out the time at some point. <laughs> but uh, uh, we covered what we had to cover, so that's not bad. So um, if you do this, if you take the F1, if you take the F1 progeny, which is uh, dihybrid, and then you self it, you'll end up again with a modified ratio, the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. When we are talking about two genes that complement each other, you will end up with a 9 to 7 ratio. So if you observe this ratio, automatically you should think two genes, complementation, affecting the same trait. Make sense? Why? Because um, if you do the crosses, you'll end up with um, only these ones being blue because you need both copies of the, um, of the enzymes to get the blue and all the rest of it will be uh, white. Does that make sense? Okay. What's 9 to 3 to 4? Epistasis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question? That's it? Okay. So uh, finishing super early today. I'll figure out the time. Uh, if you have any questions, guys, uh, you can ask them now. Um, I, I tried to be faster for the next guy, but I went too fast. So <laughs> we'll figure it out. Sounds good. See you later.